Okay, let's get started, everyone. <laughs> Let's get started, everyone here. Um, how's everyone doing? Good. Good, good. Uh, before we get started here, a couple things here. Uh, a lot of you asked how vacation went. Vacation went excellent. Uh, for those of you who were wondering, we went down to California. And so we drove down. So we went through the Yellowstone when it was flooding. It was pretty intense to see the water. Serenity had the window down taking a video, and the water from the river was actually splashing up inside the, you know, she was getting a little bit wet. So it was actually... Uh, we we're getting out, we we're going right through Yellowstone as they were evacuating Yellowstone at the same time, so it was pretty interesting. We went down to Vegas and stayed on the strip, gave the kids a uh, experience. We walked around uh, the strip of Vegas, and so it was very educational. And uh, I think mom and I were a couple times trying to like walk to hover, to keep the eyes hidden uh, from certain things. And uh, so we made it through Vegas and then down to Los Angeles. We stayed with my aunt down there. Uh, we, we did the uh, Disneyland thing, we did the Universal Studios. Um, I thought it would be wise to take the Metrolink to give the uh, kids an experience. The Metrolink did the subway to get to Universal Studios. And uh, the subway, let's just put it this way, the Metrolink was fine, but the subway was not as good as I recall it being. Uh, very, very, uh, yeah, I would talk to one guy, he's like, no, don't do that. So on the way back, we missed our links, and then uh, my, my cousin <clears throat> had to drive to get us at Universal Studios. And so she saved a bunch of North Dakota, uh, naive North Dakota folks uh, in Universal Studios. And then we went down to San Diego, saw the Midway uh, aircraft carrier, uh, went to the beach in San Clemente, then over to Phoenix. And I was telling Wally that I sw swung by a knife factory on, in Phoenix and saw Serenity's aunt and, uh, aunt and uncle all the way up through Colorado and Mount Rushmore and back, so over 4,000 miles. Wow. Yeah, so yeah, it was pretty good. So good, good time. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll try to post a little pithy, make a little pithy video to share because I know quite a few were asking how it went. So I'll try to put together a pithy video, post it online if everybody wants to see it. Okay. So it's good to be back. Missed you guys. So it's a good thing. So, all right, let's pray. I'll tell you what we're going through today, and we'll go from there. Okay. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift of the church, the family of the church. We thank you for the gift of your word and sacrament that sustain us as your church. Be with us as we study today, as we contemplate the uh, societal and cultural shifts going on in our midst, as well as studying the book of Hosea. Bless and keep us in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, um, as a way of wanting to hit very briefly, we're going to take about 15 minutes. So it's 9.33, we're going to take about 15 minutes. We're going to go through this half sheet, and this half sheet is on the issue of the Roe versus Wade. And so we want to address that briefly as a church to think about. And then after that, we're going to jump in, dip our toe into the book of Hosea. And so the book of Hosea, uh, the introduction for that Old Testament book here. Okay, So with regard to Roe versus Wade, uh, one thing I want to make sure to do is that I, I as we talk about this just very briefly, um, I don't want us to get uh, pulled into the necessary the political arguments on it. We as a church, we have a voice on this subject because it is a voice of morality, and it's a voice that deals with underneath the sixth commandment, which is the issue of life. But keep in mind the sixth commandment, God says, "Thou shall not murder," and the reason why He says that is because life is a gift. So keep in mind, oh fifth, yep, excuse me, fifth commandment. Thank you. Uh, yeah, we're getting there. Yeah, sixth commandment will be Hosea. We're gonna get there. <laughs> so, <clears throat> so uh, <clears throat> with that said, okay. So keep in mind that each of the commandments, they're not God's killjoys on life. They are God protecting gifts that He gives to us. So He gives us the gift of authority. So He says to obey authority. He gives us the gift of life. He says to do not murder life. He gives you the gift of marriage, the gift of a good reputation, the gift of possessions, gift of contentment. They're all gifts that are given to us, and the Ten Commandments act like a fence that protect those gifts. And so, when it comes to life, we know that life is a gift because God seeks to protect it through that fifth commandment. So, with the decision of Roe versus Wade um, being reversed, um, real quickly though, what we have to acknowledge first and foremost is what the, they actually did is they actually removed removed the federal 
ruling on Roe v. Wade, uh, making it a right for the federal system as a whole. In other words, they pushed it back to the states. So conceivably, what's going to happen in states like California and New York is nothing's going to change. Absolutely nothing will change in states like California uh, and New York. Uh, states like North Dakota, South Dakota, and so forth will have to wait to see what happens uh, with each state legislating on it. Now, keep in mind, they can also bring motions to the House and the Senate to make bills and propose bills to actually uh, reinstitute the federal view of abortion. They can do that at a national level by making a law. Essentially, what the court said, though, is in the Constitution, uh, the, the abortion itself is not a right according to the Constitution which I think is a very, very wise ruling. It's, we just we don't see it there. Okay? But nonetheless, what we want to do is we want to look at life itself. And the tendency for us is to see the court system making a ruling and say, aha, there the court actually says that um, you know, life is in the womb or whatever. We have to be careful that we don't put all of our stock into what the court says. Okay? The court itself, when it resembles and mirrors God's uh, decrees and his word, then we rejoice. But our authority and our understanding of our ethics and morality actually supersede man-made courts. That makes sense. So if you look at this half sheet, it says this, what, what makes life valuable? Okay. So the value of life. So this is our Christian response. Does a cultural norm, a legal decision, a mother's choice, or good DNA make life valuable? Tragically, if humanity is in charge of discerning the value of life, well, history has shown us that humanity has failed consistently. For example, genocide, abortion, euthanasia, and so forth. Alas, life is not valuable because of the created opinions and schemes. So, we do not put value on life because mankind says that life is valuable. Okay? Mankind is not the measuring stick on the essence of life. So just because a court will validate life, or a doctor will validate life, or a mother's choice will validate life, doesn't mean that that validates life for us from a Christian perspective. So the opinions and the schemes of mankind have no weight and bearing on what constitutes life. That makes sense? So when it comes to this, uh, when it comes to life, the created opinions and schemes do not have the basis of putting value on life. Instead, life is valuable because the Creator says so. Indeed, life from the womb to the deathbed is valuable, precious, and treasurable to the Lord because every life, no matter how big or small, is one He considered worthwhile to bleed and to die for. So clearly the Bible, uh, as we see throughout all the Scriptures, uh, that, that the Scriptures recognize life in the womb. Okay, An argument with an old high school friend on this, and uh, we're going back and forth, and uh, he was saying that life begins at, begins at first breath, when a person actually comes out of the womb and breathes. And so I, I pushed back on him. I said, okay, is it the capability of breath or when they actually breathe? You know, you have some really big dis discrepancies on this. So he was asking me, well, what, what was my opinion on it? And so I decided to take the Bible and lay, put the Bible aside. And I thought I'm just going to go at science because he was not actually a Christian. He did not respect uh, Christianity. So I went to the area of science. I said, you know, when I'm in the hospital, uh, when we declare death on a prisoner, usually what happens, the nurse will come in or the doctor will come in, and uh, they'll touch, what, the wrist or the neck? And they're feeling for what? Heartbeat, or they'll look on the monitor. And, and once there's no pulse, then the nurse or the doctor will declare the death. They'll, they'll look at their watch and say, so declare death at 7.03 p.m. And they declare the death on the basis of what? No heartbeat. Um, I, I can recall being with one of my family members when they died. Uh, the, the, the breath would come and it would go. And so they would breathe. And then they'd stop breathing. And you're like, okay. Yes. You know, and then you're feeling there's still a pulse. And all of a sudden, <gasps> then the breath would fire up again. right? And so we did not base life and death on the basis of breath. We did it on the basis of a heartbeat. And so my, my, my push back against this other individual is, well, if we declare death on the basis of an absence of a heartbeat, why not constitute life at the basis of a heartbeat to be logically consistent? And he could not go there. He absolutely could not go there. He refused to go there. And he, stepped on, he kept on indicating that, that breath was the issue of, of life. And, and, I, and I kept on pushing. Now, he didn't want to admit 
that uh, the heartbeat would constitute life because then that would then give credence to what? That there's life in the womb. That makes sense? Okay. Yep. Yep. So, yep. So the two ways that we constitute death would be brain dead and um, a lack of a heartbeat. So, I'll give me an example. We had uh, one of my former prisoners, a young boy. Um, he was in a four wheeler accident, and he hit his head so incredibly hard that it essentially, my I'm not a doctor, so I apologize. Essentially dislodged his brain, disconnected it from the inside. So his brain was there, but it wasn't connected to anything. So they connected the machine, there was no brain waves, whatever. So they declared him what? Officially brain dead. And the mom asked me, you know, Pastor Richard, what, what do we do? Do we, do we pull the life support? He was on life support. Do we pull that or not? So then we constitute, okay, by pulling the life support, are we causing death or are we allowing death? Now, obviously, we'd be allowing death. What would be the cause of death? It would be the four-wheeler. We'd be allowing death to happen. So ethically, we could pull that. Now, even though he was considered brain dead, they didn't declare death until what? The heart stopped afterwards. So there was almost like a two-tier. Yep, he's brain dead, which then led to the cons constitute to pull the, pull the apparatus. And then at that point, they declared him officially dead once his heart stopped. You know, but they're, they're, they're both, they go both hand in hand. Well, I, I understand. I yep. was just wondering, because that was how you're hearing Yeah. There's so much. Yeah, there's a lot of. <laughs> so, so yes, Virginia. Was the same verse it was totally misconstrued. Yeah. Yep. that's being quoted is that, that God breathed life into Adam and Eve and there's a the breath yeah. that gives life. But that word breath there is actually, a, if I remember the Hebrew, it's a ruach, which is, is to breathe life. It's to breathe the spirit into the soul, into the, 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 the body. So we're created out of dust, so we're made of what? Matter, body, and then there's a soul. So that soul was breathed in. So it's not necessarily air that was breathed into Adam. It was the soul that was breathed in. So they, they misconstrue Genesis chapter 1, 2, and 3. What yeah. if Yeah. And so so when when you have a pagan using the Bible, it's 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 for me when when I'm talking to a pagan who does not agree with the Bible, I try not to use the Bible. I try to go what? Totally science like I did there. Now obviously we would conclude that life begins at conception. But I didn't go there biblically. I went there, what? I thought if I could just go to the what issue of science for the heart, that's a good place to start. Because the majority of uh, life is taken after there's actually a heartbeat in the womb. So, okay? So, for us here, we understand what life is and the value of life, not on the basis of mankind's opinion, but on the basis of what the Creator says. And as Virginia rightly stated, uh, there's passages in the Old Testament that were knit together in our mother's womb. Think about uh, with, with Elizabeth and Mary when they encounter each other. And what does John the Baptist do when he's in Elizabeth's tummy? Leaps. Leaps, right? Because baby John the Baptist, right, you know, has a little bit of a freak out moment because what? He's near baby Jesus in Mary's womb. So there's definitely, we see life. I mean, it's pretty pretty cool to see Okay, and so we rejoice in the overturning of Roe versus Wade. Now, not to score political points, okay, but because today's decision aligns itself with the Creator's view of life. 
when the created mar the creator, we repent. And so when we, the created, get things wrong on the basis of who the creator is and what the creator says, we repent. And so with abortion, uh, even if we have never performed or been involved with abortion, we still repent as a nation. We confess it as sin. We mourn. We weep. When the created mar the image of the creator, we repent, all of us. When the created mirror the creator, we rejoice. When we look to the world and when the world gets it right, when the world actually aligns itself with the creator, we say, God be praised. Even if a godless pagan gets it right, we say, God be praised, because that's morally good, right, and salutary. Okay? So the basis of life and the basis of what makes life valuable is not the basis of mankind's opinion. And again, we can look to World War II and just let's see what happened with Nazi Germany, how they viewed the life, right? And all the millions of people that they killed. And so no matter how fallen a person is, they are what? Created originally in the image of God, and they're one in whom Christ died for and bled. And so no matter if it's the little one or a big one, young or old, we value all life, okay? And that's especially life at the deathbed itself. Um, one of the things that for me as a pastor that I try to really emphasize is that when loved ones die, that we ethically go through that correctly so that our conscience can be clean. So we talk through all the different scenarios. So if a person's in the, the ICU, when you want to actually pull the plug, as they would say, we have to assess that in so many different ways. We talk about it. We process it. We go through it. That's one of the jobs as a pastor, so that when it does happen, three months down the road, the conscience doesn't kick in and say, did I actually kill my loved one? You can actually say, I actually went through it. I responded and respected life itself. That makes sense? Okay. So we rejoice with the decision of Roe versus Wade because to a certain small degree, the 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 the... the, the Government, the United States as a, as a whole, uh, aligned itself a little bit more with what? The creator, creator's view. Okay? But their decision does not validate life. The Lord validates life. It's uh, bigger than the what Supreme Court says. Okay? That makes sense? Okay. Second thing we want to consider is this. There's a lot of comments on this freedom of choice. Now, this can be very, very difficult to process for many people. But, but I want us to hear this out here for a second, okay? Much ink is spilt on the slogan of freedom of choice, as if humanity has bodily and spiritual autonomy. However, this notion is nothing more than the golden calf of what is called nihilism. Mark this. We do not have ownership of our bodies, as if we can do as we wish. For the single person, the body is not their own, but it is a member of Christ and a shrine of the Spirit, bought with a price to be an agent through which God is glorified. We get that from 1 Corinthians 6. For the married individuals, the aforementioned applies as well with one addition. The man's body actually belongs to his wife, and the woman's body belongs to her husband. To the point, we are not our own. To believe otherwise is not only unchristian, but also advances the depressive and hopeless plague of nihilism. So what I'm saying is this, is I cannot say, this is my body, I can do whatever what I want with it. Okay, why? This body belongs to who? Belongs to Christ, been purchased at a price. And this body also belongs to my wife, right? And so I'm called to be a steward of this body that I've been given as a gift to take care of this body so that I might be of service to my wife and my kids and my family and the rest of the church and those in society. But the idea that I can, what, eat, drink, and be merry and do whatever I want that actually comes back to what is called nihilism. Nihilism is a, is a teaching that says there's no God, there's no objectiveness, there's nothing, so there's no meaning in life. So if there's no God, there's no objectiveness, no meaning in life, then guess what? We are each individual little islands unto ourselves and we can do whatever we want. This is the, the whole premise of Ecclesiastes and the premise of 1 Corinthians. This idea, so if, if, if there's no God and there's no meaning to life, then... The result is, let's eat, drink, and be merry, because tomorrow we die. So who cares? Let's do whatever we want. It's my body. I can do whatever I want with it, because tomorrow I die. There's no purpose. There's no, there's no ownership. There's, there's no, you know, who cares? That is actually an extremely depressive um, disposition to have. 
If you view yourself as an island and that there's no meaning to life, no God, no ownership of yourself, that, that you're just, what, one little mass of tissue and emotions bouncing around this universe, you can do whatever you want because tomorrow you die, that is an absolute great deal of hopelessness, okay? It's a, it's a, it's a tragic hopelessness that, that leads to. So we understand that our bodies matter to God. They matter to God because they will be resurrected. If our bodies didn't matter, then guess what? They wouldn't be resurrected from the dead. So if our bodies were just like shells, they'd be cast into what? The ditch. No point doing a funeral. Just let our bodies rot because who cares? But because our bodies matter to God, we deal with our bodies with great reverence because the Lord will resurrect those bodies, the same bodies, resurrect them, and join it with, a, <clears throat> with our soul to give us life yet again. That makes sense? And so because our, ma our bodies matter to God, they matter in this life, and there's ownership to those, and so we are not free to do whatever we will and please with our bodies. Okay? Now that is very offensive to our culture. Our culture that says, what, it's my body, my choice, I can do whatever I want. Um, it's just, frankly, it's, just, it's, it's, it's a pagan view. A Christian view is, this is not my body. My body has been purchased at a price, it belongs to the Lord. I'm called to be faithful to my body. Because I can actually sin against my body and I can sin against the Lord. And so I'm faithful, a good steward of my body, as I live this life uh, from the what? From the birth to the grave. Because this body will be resurrected. Does that make sense? Okay. Yeah, I guess well, um, historically, just so you know, with historically with cremation, I think maybe we've hit this before. Historically with cremation, now this is not the intent that people are doing right now. Historically with cremation, what they would do is is the different pagan rulers would actually burn the bodies of Christians and they take the ashes and they scatter them all over the place. And it was like, ha ha ha, good luck, Lord Jesus Christ, finding all those pieces and putting them back together again. And so it was a way to what? despise the, 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 the resurrection of the dead, the teaching of that. It was a way to put salt on an open wound to Christians. Um, with, with, uh, with cremation, if you take a cremated body and you take a non-cremated body, that body, that skeletal structure, will eventually, given enough time, it'll return to what? Ash. ash, yeah. And so we're, we're from ash and we return to ash. Well, guess what? The Lord Jesus Christ can and will resurrect all those particles and put it back together again. We're promised that. So what happens to maybe a person that is, that is uh, uh, you know, in war, uh, an explosion, you know, uh, that body will be resurrected in Christ. And so we have assurance of that. God. Yep. And so the one thing though, and I've said this before, I've, I've encouraged, I've always encouraged, uh, for those that want to do cremation, I've always encouraged to try to have the body present at the funeral, it's been my opinion that uh, when there is no body and just what an urn and a picture, people don't grieve as well. That's just my own personal experience working with with the dozens upon dozens upon dozens of funerals. That people grieve the best when they actually have a body to say goodbye to. So my encouragement is to have the body present at some sort of funeral or some sort of service, and then after that, if you want to cremate, go for it but to have a body present so that people can touch the body, kiss the body, say goodbye. That makes sense? Okay? Sometimes what has happened is individuals, you know, they see grandma or, or grandpa, and then also they get the phone call, grandpa, grandma's dead. They show up, and there's a picture in a box. And it, it's kind of a disconnect. You know, is, is, is he here? Is he just gone? You know, but if there's a body, it helps them, what? Solidify, to, to grieve. And so that's my encouragement to you, is, is to consider having that body somehow present to help people grieve. And then after that fact, if you cremate, that would be after the fact. Does that make sense? I, I, my husband went to heaven, and I knew that he was lying there, and he was not happy because he was a very active person. You know, and I, I told him, I said, honey, it's okay to go. I'm fine. Yep, I remember the night was one of the nights, I'm not sure if it was the night that Willard passed away or not. It was two in the morning and it was in my pickup, Marlene, and I got in my car and just seen how much he was suffering. And I, I punched, I was so angry at death, I punched the ceiling of my pickup and I hurt my hand pretty good. But I was so angry at death and I actually cussed at death. And I, and I started singing the Kyrie in my pickup before I went home. 
in knowing that um, even though Willard suffered, knowing that I will see him again, that Jesus will put him back together again. Yes. Yeah. I, I yeah. haven't had a chance to cry yeah. and grieve yeah. because I'm so happy. Yeah. Yeah. So All right. Any other thoughts on this here? situations where the body we have to keep that in mind too sometimes when the body is is not presentable then in those situations um that those those have to be handled delicately yeah but you know there's part of me that just wonders you know he always wore you know Levi jeans and the same boots it's like you know maybe if i would have just yeah and then like um and then um my grandma smith she had that picture up front too, so I never really grieved her either. So I do mm-hmm. understand what you're saying. Yeah. That, I mean, yeah. So I guess I do understand. Any other thoughts on this, Virginia? It's funny though, we get on the topic of talking about, you know, adults or people who die, and we see their body, feel their body, or have ashes and have a visual. When women have the abortion, there is no visual for them. You know, they, they don't show them the ultrasound. They don't want them to see that. So when they grieve later on, there, there's like hopelessness for them. They feel guilt and shame, but they don't go to the church to talk about it because they feel shame because of what they've done. Yeah. Unfortunately, unfortunately um, this is going to be, boy, this is, I'm, I'm going to walk lightly when I say this. When our God is that which we fear, love, and trust. Okay, so the first commandment teaches us that we can have many different gods than the real God. So whatever we fear, love, and trust is that which is our God. So if you take and you get rid of God, the fact of the matter is we cannot live in a nihilistic mindset. We cannot live as an individual island. We don't function that way as individuals. So I cannot live as a king unto myself with me Matt Richard deriving my own meaning, me deriving my own thoughts, my own words. I cannot function that way. Our bodies are not intended to work that way. So we always have to ascribe our identity to some other God that we can live underneath. We like to have that safety of having something above us. But if it is not the Lord God, we try to put something else there. What often happens is, and I see this in our culture right now, is there's an absence of our Lord God Almighty. So we put in the space of God, we put the state the government, or it can be an ideology, or it can be something else. But a lot of individuals put the state up here. And then what the state actually constitutes and states will then, what, inform the conscience. So if the state itself is supporting abortion, then the conscience can be, what, clear that I've, what, I'm, I'm okay. But now that the state has, what, thrown Roe versus Wade out, then the conscience now bears that burden to justify if I've, what, done abortion or supported it, now the, the God of the state is no longer justifying that position. Does that make sense? And so what we see is, is, is tragically, we see many individuals um, uh, trying to seek some sort of atonement for that. Well, the church has the good news. There's atonement for that in Christ. And so our view should be compassion and um, grace and forgiveness to a world that is seeking an atonement from the state, because the state is not Christ. The state will not endure, but Christ does. So we have a message of atonement, a message of forgiveness for the world to hear. Does that make sense? Yeah. 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 Our response should be, Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy, right? Yeah. Is he 
feel like a lot of the comments that I was reading yesterday and stuff, they would ask the questions and like most, the answers were simply um, God. Yeah. I, they truly were. It was, they, and, and then it was just, you know, it, it starts just absence and uh, being smart from day one and teaching and um, it just, it was just, and then just things got so carried away and now it's just, it, it's all, everything turns into hate in the end. Yeah, so... For us at the church, I would say that we remember who we are, remember what life, the value of life is, we understand that we are owned by another, and then we ultimately understand there's forgiveness. Um, there's forgiveness in Christ. Uh, there's no sin that is so out of reach of the arms of Christ. So it's not like Christ says, it is finished, oh, except for that sin over there, or that sin over there. All that's finished in Christ, and there is forgiveness in Christ, and that's, that's the hope we have as a church. Okay, for the sake of moving on, Let's jump in there, dip our toe into Hosea. We'll see how far we get. And uh, we're going to do a basic overview of Hosea. Okay? We have about 15 minutes. We'll see how far we get. Okay? All right. Hosea, you guys ready? Uh, I, I do have to say, fasten your seatbelt. Uh, seriously, fasten your seatbelt. Um, this book is going to it's gonna rock you. Okay? All right. Hosea. Authors. Hosea the prophet. Date 740 to 715 B.C. So we're talking about 700 years before Jesus. Okay? 700 years before Jesus in the place of Israel. Okay? So the purpose of the book of Hosea is this. Israel was like an unfaithful wife. She was attracted away from her husband, the Lord, to other lovers, idols. In the book of Hosea, the Lord calls Israel back to himself. It is a call for Israel to forsake her unfaithfulness and be restored in the Lord's faithfulness. Uh, Hosea is the most quoted minor prophet in the whole New Testament. New Testament. Yeah, yeah, in New Testament. Yep. So Hosea is in the section of the minor prophets, the first one in the minor prophets. And so let's just, let's just keep on unpacking a little bit here, okay? So let's just read what we have written here. It all began with marriage. But the marriage of Hosea and Gomer was no ordinary nuptial. So Hosea is the prophet. Gomer is his wife. Uh, not a very flattering name, but nonetheless, that's her name. Initiated by the word of God, it was permeated with the purposes of revelation. A divine call was heard by Hosea that turned his life into a sanctuary where God's holy love was to be known. The tone of the book is set by God's mandate to take a wife who would become a harlot, a prostitute, have children who turn from God, and then know God's passion for his covenant people. In other words, Hosea's life and marriage were shaped and directed by the Lord to mimic or parallel Israel's marriage to God. What Hosea experienced with his unfaithful wife Gomer, the Lord God experienced with unfaithful Israel. Okay, so think of it this way. You have, you have God, right, and Israel. God is going to be depicted as a husband. Israel is going to be depicted as the wife. Israel, the nation is unfaithful to God, Israel the nation goes after other idols. So if a husband, a wife, if a wife goes after another man, that's adultery, right? And there's unfaithfulness. So now, God says to Hosea, Hosea, you're going to marry Gomer, and as you marry Gomer, you're going to experience, in, a, in essence, what I'm experiencing with Israel. So you're going to marry Gomer, and guess what, you're going to have some kids, and guess what? She's going to leave you. She's going to run from you. She's going to go prostitute herself with other men. And thus, you will experience, in essence, maybe a glimpse of the pain that the Lord God has for Israel. And then, as we're going to get into this later on, instead of what? Dismissing your wife and letting her go, I'm going to call you to what? Pursue her. In other words, she's not going to like give you a call and say, Hey, Hosea, what's up? How's things been going at home? She makes no move to Hosea at all. She made no movement towards him, no reaching out to him, nothing. Hosea is 100% responsible for pursuing her and finding her and chasing her down, even though she's 100% unfaithful, which is the same thing the Lord God does to what? Unfaithful Israel. He pursues her, Israel, and does not let her go, even though Israel is unfaithful to the Lord. So this is the, this is the stage that's being set here. Make sense? Well, it doesn't, it isn't that God has foreknowledge 
<coughs> he, got, he did not direct the, the uh, incidents, but he has a foregoing. Yeah, so, so what we see here is we see the pursuit of God for unfaithful mankind. And so, if anything else, it's, it's not about the pursuit of mankind. <laughs> okay, I mean, that, that's, frankly speaking, I know there's a church in town that calls himself the pursuit. It's actually quite of a foolish name because we see it's flipped, it's actually reversed. You know, if it's the pursuit and they had a picture of what? Jesus carrying a cross with the crown of thorns, that would be perfect. He pursues us. This idea of mankind pursuing Jesus, it, it's, it's really quite foreign to the scriptures. We typically are the ones that are what? Unfaithful Israel running the opposite way. Okay? So, with that in mind, okay, it's important to address multi a multitude of things with the book of Hosea before studying. For the sake of simplicity, the various points of concern will be listed below in number points. Number one, Hosea, Gomer, and his family are not a parable. They are real people who lived in a real time and place. Their lives, though, show the drama, despair, and problems of real-time Israel. Think of them as a parallel accounts. Different people and groups, but with the same struggles. Okay? So this is not a parable. Hosea was real. Gomer was real. These were real-life events. They just happened to what? Through the orchestration of God, they parallel what's going on in a greater scheme, a greater perspective with Israel. Number two. The problems of Israel were that it was influenced by the cult of Baal, had instability of leadership, and had naive foreign policies. As a result, the high living rich exploited the poor, merchants took dishonest profits, money controlled the courts, and crowds filled religious shrines. Sounds familiar? <clears throat> yep. No, nothing new under the sun, you guys. Number three. This work gets really interesting. Theologically speaking, the problem of Israel was that large portions of its citizens worshipped Baal. Baal or Baal, okay? Baal was connected to a fertility cult. Specifically stated, Baal was a pagan god that produced, supposedly produced new rains and new crops. And so high places, altars for Baal were established in the land. At these high places, though, there would be temple prostitutes. By having intercourse with these prostitutes, it was believed that devotion was being shown to Baal, which would result in good grain, crops, livestock, and so forth. Ritual prostitution was the sort of worship that became mingled with the faith of the people of Israel. It is now not hard to see why the Lord's cho Lord chose marriage as a metaphor to reveal the unfaithfulness of Israel. So think about this. How much this would appeal, especially to the men, the farmers. You want a good crop? Yes, I want a good crop. Do you want good rain? I want good rain. Do you want good reproductiveness of your cattle to reproduce and to give birth and to have, have um, lots of heads of cattle? Yes, I want that. Um, so here's what you do. You take some money. Got some money. You go down to the high place, the altar. Check. I know where one is. You come there. You give money. Sounds good. Then you have sex with a prostitute. Check. And as a result of that, what? You'll have good fortune. <laughs> Boy. <laughs> Now, when I was in seminary, when I was in seminary, one of my, my, my seminary buddies goes, he goes, you know what, if I'm going to invent a religion, I'd invent something like this. Because <laughs> this would be very lucrative. I, I could make a lot of money at this. So he's like, man, if I'm going to invent a religion, they, they're on to something here, right? Money, sex, prosperity, right? So then guess what? You'd run down to what? Bring your money, go down and have sex with the prostitute. Honey, how was your day? Oh, we're down to the shrine. How'd that go? Gave some money, had sex with the prostitute. Oh, we're going to have a good crop. You betcha. Right? Okay? All in day's work. All in day's work, right? So now we see, uh oh, we see what's going on here. Okay, it's interesting, number four. It's interesting to note that the Lord does not hold the Canaanites responsible for the corruption. Instead, he holds his own people responsible. The blame is not put on the foreign enticement, but the blame is put on the unfaithful Israel. So now keep in mind, Israel, <clears throat> during this time, the Assyrians were to the north, and you had the Egyptians to the south. The Assyrians were a little bit weak at that time, so Israel was, the, 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 the territory of Israel was expanding a little bit. And, and what would happen is, during those times, which happens all the time, is, is you have territorial lines between different nations, and sometimes they would bump into each other, and sometimes they overlap. And so what happens, they overlap, and then the culture of different, um, the culture of different nations will sometimes bleed into the other culture, and they overlap. So you have this idea of Baal, it's bleeding into the nation of Israel. 
So it's coming into the borderlands. And so people are what? A little bit of God here. And oh yeah, my neighbor down the street just, just checked out the high altar. I'll probably grab a little of that too. So they were all mingling. They had what? The, 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 the worship of God Almighty. And at the same time, they would dabble with what? Baal at the same time. So might as well do both, right? We kind of syncretize them together. Okay? So this is what's going on. So now, the point being is in Hosea, the blame is not put on the Canaanites. It's not put on that foreign god. It's put on the Israelites, or we can say put on the church for what? Being gullible and foolish and giving into that. So the burden is put on what? The church, not necessarily the culture. Okay? So the point being is I'm making is this, is we can attack the culture all we want, but the fact of the matter is the culture is the culture. The bigger burn has to be put on what? Us. To resist the culture. For us to what? Be aware of the culture. That makes sense? Okay? Number five. Regarding marriage. Jose and Gomer's marriage is not to be thought of in the realm of partnership. There is a much more patriarchal feature to marriage in the book of Hosea than complementarian. Now I'll explain that down the road as we get into this a little further. Furthermore, Gomer does not represent women. Instead, Gomer represents Israel as a whole. So when we look at Gomer, we're not going to say, oh, you women. No, it's what? The nation of Israel. Gomer represents men and women, the unfaithfulness of men and women to the Canaanite god of Baal. Finally, the prostitution of Gomer was not subtle, but was blatant. Some scholars even believe that Gomer was no ordinary prostitute, but a temple prostitute, that she was perhaps one of those individuals that was at the temple of Baal, giving herself to other men. This is who Hosea married, you know. This is this is the gal who would be on the Christmas cards, you know. The, how's it going? Hi, from Hosea and kids, right? You know, how's it going? Well, uh, Gomer was here, but she's gone again, you know, right? So finally, we must keep in mind that Hosea is not the hero. However, he mimics the ultimate hero, the faithful Lord. Lastly, while we can indeed learn a lot about the Sixth Commandment and marriage from the book of Hosea, it is more important, it's so important, it is more important for us to understand that the book of Hosea intends to teach us about the chesed. My old professor would say, you have to say it with a little bit of phlegm in your Chesed. I probably have too much phlegm there. Chesed. The chesed love. This the chesed love of God. How the Lord... Lord, how the Lord's faithful love deals with unfaithful, unfaithful love. The chesed love is the pursuing, never-ending, never-stopping love of God for unfaithful Israel. So on the side, you have what? This here? This is the word chesed. goes from what? Right to left. Chesed. This is the chesed love. So as we go through Hosea, we're going to hear over and over and over about the chesed love of God which would be the equivalent of the New Testament agape love. They're very, very similar. Agape and hesed love. It's a kind of love that never stops, that never gives up, that goes no matter what, and goes regardless of the other person. Okay? This is the love of Christ. Finally, the marriage metaphor can most certainly be carried forward in the New Testament view of Christ and His bride, the church. This is the parallel. We see Christ is the bridegroom, and the church is the bride. And what does Christ do? He pursues an unfaithful church constantly over and over and over. Okay? Constantly over and over and over. So Hosea opens the door for us to understand love and sacrifice as mutual subjections required for a healthy marriage. So it's not necessarily a book on marriage, it's a book on what? The pursuant of God towards an unfaithful Israel. And so in this book, what we're going to see is we will identify ourselves, we will identify ourselves with Gomer, we'll identify ourselves with Israel. And then we understand that Hosea is a picture of who? Christ. A picture of Christ. Hosea is mimicking what? The pursuant of God towards unfaithful Israel. That makes sense? Okay? We have one minute. Any questions on that? I'm surprised we got through that. That's good. Do I have your attention? <laughs> Pastor, you have my attention at temple prostitution. I'm in. <laughs> okay. I mean, it, it's, 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 it's graphic, you guys. Um, and boy, I, 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 we're going to get to this. 
Um, there's some really, some really good stuff. Um, they actually did a movie of this. Um, the Francine Rivers did a book called Redeeming Love. It was based off of this, and they did a recent movie of this, uh, Redeeming Love, which is based off of the narrative of Hosea. And so, uh, very good. All right, can you, can, you, can you guys say that? Chesed, yeah. Chesed? Let's try it. No, don't, I have an argument. Give an umbrella here. Right, let's try it. One, two, three. Okay, pretty good. Good enough. Close enough. Right? Yep, the pursuit of the God. All right, let's stand and pray. Okay? I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have kept me this night from all harm and danger, and I pray that you would keep me this day also from sin and every evil, that all of my doings in life may please you. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul and all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. All right, thank you guys.